evening. It's good to see everybody tonight. Uh, glad to be here. Hope you had a good afternoon. Thankful for coming back tonight. We get to worship God a second time. Uh, tonight, uh, the title of our lesson, if you've recognized this before, You Can Lead a Horse to Water. Anybody know the rest? You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. There's a big spiritual application here tonight. We've probably all heard this phrase before, uh, and the idea is that you can only do so much for somebody else, and then it's up to them. Right? You know, I, I mean, imagine this illustration here with that language. Imagine pulling and leading a 2,000-pound horse to his drinking water. The task of you know, pulling the horse and, and leading him to the water, you know, that's a strenuous and a difficult task to do. Uh, but when it's all said and done, if that horse doesn't want to drink water, he ain't going to drink water. You, know, he, uh, you cannot make a 2,000 pound horse drink. Even if you know he needs it, it's up to the horse. So I figured that this would be a good lesson to uh, follow up this morning's sermon on evangelism and reaching lost souls. We, we discussed uh, that we've been commissioned by Jesus to preach the gospel to every creature. Make it known, Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Our job as Christians is uh, just to, to make the good news of salvation loud and clear to this world. Sow the seed, preach the word, get the message out there. But what we mentioned this morning is, uh, you know, as, as much as we want souls to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, the reality is, all you can do is sow the seed. That's all you can do. You cannot make somebody obey the gospel. You can't make them. Whether or not they decide to obey Christ, that's entirely up to them. And we're told to sow the seed. So you know, what a frustrating concept that can be when we know exactly what Jesus Christ has to offer and the soul won't accept it. You know, we throw up our hands and we say, why not? I don't get it. Uh, when you understand that the stakes are so high, uh, that this is a choice between heaven or hell. And people willfully choose hell. You know, sometimes it just baffles our mind. I just don't get it. Why? It's so plain. But the point is, you cannot make someone accept eternal life. As much as you would like them to have it, as much as you know it would benefit them, and you know the suffering of hell, and you know what the Bible says, all you can do is sow the seed. That's all. You give them the choice. Maybe you can cultivate the soil a little bit to maybe get the seed a little, you know, that it can get into their heart a little better. Maybe you can water the seed, as, the, as 1 Corinthians talks about. But in essence, it's up to the horse if it's going to drink. So, you know, the foundation of tonight's lesson hinges upon mankind's free will to choose his own decisions. God has allowed free will from the very beginning. He's never forced someone to to love him. He's never forced someone to serve him. It's always been up to the individual. You know, if the false doctrine of Calvinism that is spreading throughout a lot of the Christian religions today, if, if Calvinism were true, then I suppose we could change the title of our lesson tonight to this. Calvinism. God forces a horse to drink the water. And that's really a picture of the false doctrine of Calvinism, right? Because the doctrine says that salvation is not your choice. And everybody's preaching it nowadays, but it's only God's choice. And even if you didn't want it, if you didn't want to serve God, God is still going to come into your heart at the time of His choosing, and He's going to make that decision for you. So a lot of people say, you're just walking down the street one day, and God comes into your heart. That's not what the Bible teaches. And you know they say you can't reject it. And I say so, so much for our free will to choose no, that's, the Bible teaches just the opposite. Right? Salvation is made available to all. But God, you know, it, it, it's made available by God, but we're all given a choice on whether or not we want it, whether we will accept it or not. Joshua 24, 15 in the Old Testament says, Choose you this day whom you will serve. Who are you going to, who are you going to choose? Tonight I want to take a, a look at several Bible characters who exercise their free will. And they chose to reject God. These are stories where God's goodness was right in front of them. 
like a horse being led to water. Right? And they had access to it. They had access to God's blessings and His goodness and His salvation. But they chose to reject God's goodness and His salvation. So you can make a horse, you can, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. It's up to the horse. So we'll call this tonight seven points, seven cases where the horse would not be made to drink. So number one, uh, let's start from the very beginning. I think this is a good example. Adam and Eve, all the way back at the very beginning. Even, even from the very first people ever created, God extended them free will. Right? You can make your own choices. You can, you can do what you would please. Here's my law. Here's what I say God, God told them. And if you want to talk about someone who was set up for success, God's blessings were laid right in front of them. You know, I would say it was our great great grandfather and mother, Adam and Eve. They had, you know, they were in the midst of the paradise of God, the Garden of Eden, which God had prepared for them. Genesis chapter 3, and verse 8 shows the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. That's where Adam and Eve dwelt. So they were in the midst of God. I mean, think about all the blessings that were in Adam and Eve's possession before the fall, before they made the decision. They were in the presence of their creator, the protector, the provider, and they were with God. They also had no knowledge of good and evil. I'd say that's a blessing. That would be an interesting existence if we could have stayed that way. How awesome is that? Their existence was such purity at that time. They didn't have that concept between good and evil. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15 says further that the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. So another one is, you know, God gave Adam responsibility in the garden. And keep in mind that this responsibility of tending and keeping the garden was before there was any curse on the ground for man's sake, that man should spend his days uh, working by the sweat of his face, the Bible says. But we can conclude that Adam's work in the garden was not overly burdensome as it is today. And it was not the strenuous nature that we have to work by today. But their whole existence was very pleasant in the Garden of Eden. They also had access to a tree, the tree of life, that could make them live forever. Fruits, when eaten, would allow them to live forever. So life was good. Life was very good in the Garden of Eden. Protected, provided, and pleasant. And that's, that was their life. And there was only one condition that we read of. Maybe there was more, but we read of one that the Lord God gave man as he lived a life of peace in the Garden of Eden. What was their condition? Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of not the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. If you eat of that tree, you'll be cut off, and you shall surely die at that point. So at, at that point in the story, God had set Adam and Eve up with complete success. They had everything they needed. He had done everything he could for them. He gave them his, their their condition, his laws, and, and he set them up very nicely. But like horses being led to water, you know, God, God's blessings were laid right in front of them. They had it. And God said, drink. Enjoy it. This is yours. But notice the lesson. God did not force them to obey his condition. He laid it before them. He said, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Whose choice was it? It was man's choice. It was Adam's choice. It was Eve's choice. So, you know, even though they were set up perfectly, even when God had done all of this, all that he could, and they had things so nice, the choice still belonged to them. Are we going to continue accepting this goodness and obedience? What's interesting is that we, they would still be alive today, in the physical, if they had never transgressed God's law. Or are we going to reject what God has said. And I say the lesson for tonight is you can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make him drink. Now we know how the story ended. Uh, and they had the choice between life and death, and they chose death because 
they broke God's simple commandment and his condition. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. You transgress God's law. So Adam and Eve were driven out from the Garden of Eden for good, separated from all of this. Number two, let's talk about another important uh, set of people. How about the people of Noah's day? were led to water, but they would not be made to drink. We mentioned Noah briefly this morning, uh, but it serves as another good example of this concept. You know, Noah was called in the New Testament, 2 Peter 2.5, a preacher of righteousness. And so this tells us that Noah proclaimed God's truth to the wicked world. He went about preaching, and, and he led the horse to water, so to speak. And although we don't read of any particular conversation between Noah and the wicked world, we can only imagine Noah trying to persuade the wicked to turn to God and warning them of the impending doom that was coming. You can imagine how Noah's life was. If he's called, this, if his title is a preacher of righteousness, now God's plan for Noah was very clear. The instructions were very clear. You can only imagine how simple Noah made it for everybody in his audience. And he preached righteousness. He would say probably, hey, God is going to destroy this world because of its wickedness. Turn to him and live. Similar message to what we preach today, right? I would love to know the number of people that Noah tried to reach during those 120 years that he was preparing to argue. I'd love to read more about that. How many people did Noah lead to the truth like a horse being led to water? How many people did he preach to and they rejected it? But as clear as Noah could possibly make it, and he probably did, and as hard as he probably tried to persuade them to listen, to get on the ark, come with me, and as much as he wanted them to listen, it was still up to each individual on whether or not they would obey God and get on the ark. It was up to man. And in the end, the Bible says only eight souls out of all of man's population at that time, only eight souls got on the ark. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Because mankind has the free will to choose. Number three, let's talk about Lot's sons-in-law. And it is sons-in-law, not son-in-laws. I, I looked it up. I didn't know how to say it. Lot's son, sons-in-law at, at Sodom and Gomorrah, they were led to water, so to speak, but would not drink. So, you know, this is an interesting part of the story. I don't, I think I've overlooked it when I would read this passage uh, in times past, but as God is about to destroy the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, God sends two men uh, who were re revealed to be angels in Genesis chapter 19 and verse 1 to save righteous Lot and those who would come with Lot, his family. In Genesis 19 and verse 12, the two angels say to Lot, they say, have you anyone else here? Son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and, and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So if you've got anybody in the city, get them out. If they'll listen to you, preach the message, get it out. In verse 14, you see his sons-in-law, and it says, So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, who married his daughter. So they were obviously men of the, of the nation or of the, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. They had married his daughters. And he said to them, get up, get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. The Bible says, but to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. Have you ever read that before? No, here's Lot. He's dead serious. Okay? And he was warning his sons-in-law about the coming destruction. What was going to happen the next day, right? God is going to destroy this city and everybody in it. Come with me and you'll live. You can only imagine these wicked men and the, the smile, the smirks on their faces. as Lot gave them the warning. And they began to grin and laugh. And the text says, to them, Lot seemed to be joking. This is a joke, right? The next morning, you know, how many, how many people went with Lot? Remember how many people went with Lot uh, to be saved from the destruction? Did his sons-in-law go with him? Only Lot? 
and his two daughters and his wife. And she didn't even make it all the way out because she turned back and turned into a pillar of salt. The Lot's sons-in-law, the two husbands of his two daughters, perished in the destruction, Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot could not have made it any more clear about what was about to happen. He laid it out plain, and even though Lot probably wanted them so desperately to come with him, right, imagine, you know what's going to happen the next day, and say, just come with me, please. And even though Lot knew what was coming, the point is, he couldn't force them. He could not force them to come. It was their decision. And they stayed. They stayed with the wicked city, and they were destroyed with the wicked city. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Number four, another Bible character in the Old Testament. King Saul is another good example of a man who was led to water, set up very nicely, but he would not be made to drink. First Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, we can read of Saul's good start as the king of Israel. The Bible says there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish. A Benjaminite, uh, of, or a, man, a, a mighty man of power, and he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. So here he is, a good-looking man. Down in verse 16, uh, God speaks to Samuel about anointing Saul as king. God says, Tomorrow about this time, Samuel, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him commander over my people Israel, that he may save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have looked upon my people because of their cry, because their cry has come before me. Chapter 10, verse 1, chapter 10, verse 1 says, Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander? over his inheritance. So with Saul, we see from the very start, Saul was set up for success. Right? You know, God was in his corner. If he wanted him, God was there. Samuel was in his corner. And he was the first king of Israel. He, it could have been so great. It could have been such a great reign. And if you look at Saul's reign as king, he actually had a pretty good beginning. Didn't he? If you read the very start of Saul's reign, it was not bad. 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 13, we see uh, Saul making a, a, a statement of faith uh, in the Lord after their victory in battle. He said, says, But Saul said, Not a man shall be put to death this day, for today the Lord has accomplished salvation in Israel. Who won the battle today, Saul? The Lord won the battle. Verse 15 says, after this victory, he says, There they made sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. So here he is set up. He, he's, he's king. He was the anointed of the Lord. And he had won some battles. And he gave the credit to God. And things are going good. And just like every other human being who has ever lived, the choice was Saul's for whom he would continue to serve. And he had that choice. So he had graciously been set up, uh, you know, led to God's blessings if he would only serve God and obey his command. But soon after, we can read about Saul going against God's authority. And so he started out well, and he started declining away from, from God. In, in 1 Samuel chapter 13, and then again in chapter 15, Saul went against God's authority. And you can read about his hatred toward God's servant David, who we know so much about King David. Uh, you know, Saul tried to kill David the spear and in different times on several occasions because he was jealous and he just hated David for his standing in the sight of the people. And, you know, though Saul could have, uh, you know, Saul could have made David a great and godly ally. They could have been friends and they could have served God together and had great success in Israel. Saul instead made an enemy of David, a godly and a godly man, and he turned his heart away from serving the Lord. 1 Samuel 15, verse 28, says, So Samuel said to Saul, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today, 
and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. Chapter 28 and verse 17, Samuel says, The Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me, for the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands, Saul, and given it to your neighbor David, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord. So Saul was set up so nicely. He, uh, you know, he could have set, he, as the first king of Israel, he could have set the standard of righteousness for all the kings who would follow. But, we understand that he was not going to be forced to follow God's way. He didn't do it. So you can lead a horse to water, set him up so nicely, put it right in front of him, but you can't make him follow God's way. You can't make him dream. Here's a good person in this discussion, number five. How about Judas in this discussion? Judas in the New Testament was another individual who was given free will and made his own decision. If you want to talk about someone else who was set up for success, he was a member of the Twelve. The original group who followed Jesus. And he, he walked with Jesus day and night in his earthly ministry for three days. He was with Jesus. He saw Jesus' miracles. He talked with him. And by the way, he was surrounded by 11 other very godly individuals who were focused on following Jesus. If ever there was an atmosphere of success for following God, you, know, you would think that Judas had it made. Right? Perfect. I mean, I'm in the midst of the twelve apostles. I'm right by Jesus. But at the end of the day, although being around godly individuals can be a great support in one's obedience to God, it's still up to the individual on whether or not they make godly decisions themselves. So it can only go so far. You can only do so much for somebody. You know, so no one is going to take you by the hand and force you to make a right decision, to make a godly decision. And Judas was not forced. You, know, you, you, you must follow wisdom yourself. And you must take the right path in wisdom yourself. You have to make that decision. So heaven was right in Judas' grasp. He was right there if he wanted it. Matthew 26 and verse 24, Jesus said, The Son of Man indeed goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Now that's a scary statement for someone like Judas. It would have been good for you if you hadn't even been born than to make the decision you made to turn from Christ. Set up so nicely but you can't make the horse drink. Number six. We could talk about the Jews just in general. The whole nation of the Israelites throughout the years. You know, from the time of Moses and the golden calf to the time of Christ, all those years in between, God so desperately wanted the children of Israel to obey his will and inherit the blessings. They were set up nicely. They were God's people. God's chosen people were exponentially set up for success with God in their corner. But Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, Jesus says of the Jews, He said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. What was the point? But you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. Now, by the way, we've been studying the Jehovah's Witnesses' false view of Jesus Christ. He was a created being. He was an angel. You know, I think that this is a good passage about Jesus' deity, by the way. Right? All through the Old Testament, we read about the Lord God in the Old Testament being the ruler of Israel. And her protector, her provider. And here Jesus is the one who says, How often I wanted to gather your children as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing, right? This is further proof that Jesus was present in the Old Testament time period as a member of the Godhead. He said, oh, I wanted to protect you. I'm a member of the Godhead. But the point is for this lesson, Israel would not be made to drink. They were not forced. He simply offered it. If you'd like to come and get under my wings, but they said, no, thank you. We'll serve idols. We'll do the things that we want to do. Jesus said, oh, I wanted you to come, 
I wanted you to come to me and make the right decision and inherit these blessings, but you weren't willing, and you wouldn't drink. Psalm 95 and verse 10, the Holy Spirit said of those who came out of Egypt, that generation, said for 40 years, the Holy Spirit says, I was grieved with that generation. And uh, they said, it is a people who go astray in their hearts, and they do not know my ways. They made the choice. They made the decision. Hebrews chapter uh, 3 and verse 10, the Hebrew writer references those same words in Psalms. He says, therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So time and time again, Israel was led to God's living water over and over again, but they refused so many times. They refused God when it was right in front of them. No. And th this language about refusing to drink water as uh, representing a refusal of God's blessing, that's a very biblical phraseology, isn't it? You know, uh, I'll read John chapter... Uh, th th basically, this is, this is one of the ways that Jesus refers to uh, salvation over and over again as water, living water. John chapter 7, verse 37 says, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out. Imagine Jesus standing up before all the people and he cries this. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. That's a very biblical language, isn't it? Literally and spiritually leading a horse to water. He said to the woman at the well, John 4 verse 10, he said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you what? Living water. Verse 13, Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. Right? If you drink from the water of this well, you'll get thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him will become a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. That's some interesting language. And what is he talking about? What is Jesus talking about with this living water that he's offering everybody? He's talking about salvation. He's talking about salvation and eternal life. He says, what I have available for you is a way that your soul can be saved from death. You can be saved from separation from God forever and ever. And it can grant you an entrance into everlasting life in heaven with the Father forever and ever. Everlasting life. And you'll have true fulfillment. Now, won't you come to me, Jesus said. Won't you just come and drink of this water? Won't you just accept the message? But notice again the important concept. Jesus simply gives the invitation. Simply gives the invitation to come and drink. And he lets the individual decide if they would like to come. If anyone thirsts, let him come and drink. I'm not going to force you. It's up to you. If you want it, it's yours. Revelation 22, verse 17, the Bible says, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And it's an invitation. Won't you come? And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts, Come. Whoever desires. Use this verse against Calvinism. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life for you. If you want eternal life, you can have it. The Bible calls it a free gift right, that, that we can accept or reject. So what you have with the gospel of Jesus Christ is really a simple invitation. You don't have to accept it. You know, no one is going to force you to accept it. But if you're willing, the Bible says you can take it. You can take it freely. It's yours if you want it. One last example on our list, and then we'll make some applications. Let's talk about King Agrippa in the New Testament. Paul was the one speaking here, and he, quote-unquote, led a horse to water, but he couldn't make him drink. Acts chapter 26, and starting in verse 25. Acts 26, starting in verse 25. But Paul said, I am not mad, or I'm not crazy, most noble Festus, but I speak the words of truth and reason. For the king, whom, before whom I also speak freely, knows these things. So here's King Agrippa right next to Festus. He says, the king knows these things. Agrippa understands. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention. 
since this thing about Jesus was not done in a corner. It was done openly. All the things that Jesus did. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. I know you believe. Verse 28, then Agrippa said to Paul, You almost persuade me to become a Christian. Isn't that interesting? You, you have to become a Christian. You have to, there's something you must do to be saved. And, and Paul said to him, verse 29, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both, almost, and altogether, such as I am. You know, we've stated that truth so many times in different lessons, that almost becoming a Christian is not the same as becoming a Christian. And almost drinking the water of life is not the same as drinking the water of life. If someone was going to get on the ark, that saved Noah, if they almost got on the ark, they weren't saved from the flood. And when Paul made the truth very plain to Agrippa so that he could understand it clearly. Paul said, I know that none of these things escape your attention. I know that you understand. And I know that you believe the prophets. But even though Paul extended a clear invitation, such as the theme throughout the entire Bible, a clear invitation is given to the wicked, he could not make Agrippa accept it. All he could do was plant the seed, preach the word. So let's close tonight with three take-home lessons that we can learn from all of these stories. Uh, three things that we can learn from these examples. Number one, remember this. People have been refusing to drink from God's blessings for a very long time. Don't get discouraged when they refuse you as you preach the gospel. You know, Adam and Eve, we talked about, refused God. The people of Noah's day refused the message. Lot's son-in-law, they wouldn't take it. King Saul, Judas Iscariot, the Israelites in general, King Agrippa. Like the list was probably a lot longer. Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. And boy, I believe it. That's very true. People have been refusing God's salvation that's laid right before my, mankind. It always has been from the very beginning of time. And God has led countless people to the waters of eternal life. Some decide to drink it, and many refuse it. It just depends on the person. It depends on the person's choice. And the lesson tonight is that if you present the gospel truth to a lost and a dying soul, and they refuse to drink. Don't let that discourage you for one second. You know, because you're in good company. There have been a lot of godly people throughout the ages, throughout the Bible, who presented the truth exactly the way God wrote it, the way God said it, and they were rejected. You know, remember that people refused to drink from God's blessings, even when it was preached by Jesus himself. Even when Jesus was offering it, people rejected it. And if people refuse to obey Jesus when it was offered by him, shouldn't you expect that he'll reject you when you preach it? If you preach the same message? Even Jesus did not persuade everyone to drink. Why not? Because it was still up to the individual and the choice that they would make. So don't, do not expect that every time you try to sow the seed and preach the gospel, sometimes we get so down on ourselves. But don't expect that every time you preach, it's going to sprout in that person to everlasting life. The Bible does not say that everyone will accept it. The Bible says we simply need to plant the seed in the soil. Sometimes it sprouts, sometimes it doesn't. Number two, this is an important principle. When they refuse you, shake off the dust from your feet. Matthew chapter 10, verse 14. Jesus said to his disciples in that passage, And whoever will not receive you nor hear your words, which you receive from me, when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Luke's account says, Shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. So, you know, what is Jesus' advice when someone refuses the gospel? Brush it off. I think that's a good way to put it. Shake off the dust from your feet. Don't let it bother you. Keep preaching. You just keep don't going. Don't let it phase you at all. Which brings us into point number three. When they refuse the gospel, you be sure that you offer it to somebody else. 
And what a sad thing it is when a Christian feels like they should give up on evangelism and preaching the gospel because they've been refused by somebody in the world. Oh no, I, I, I couldn't convince them to follow Jesus Christ. I guess I'll never try again. And I say, are you kidding me? Right, the Bible says, shake off the dust from your feet and keep going. Keep planting the seed. Of course, people are going to reject the message. They always have, always will. The failure is not on you. The failure is on them. God is going to give the account on their record, not yours. But what you have to do is preach the gospel. In Acts chapter 13, verse 44, we can read about Paul's preaching being rejected. The great apostle Paul preached to the unbelieving Jews, but that didn't stop Paul, did it? We're going to read verse 44. It says, on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitude, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. They didn't like what Paul was saying. Verse 46, then Paul and Barnabas grew bold. They took courage, right? And they said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, Jews. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Notice he said, you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Behold, we turn to the Gentiles. So, okay, you've rejected the gospel, so be it. Now I'm going to preach to somebody else. And that's, that needs to be our attitude at times. You know, when someone won't hear it, when they refuse it, okay, let's go on to somebody else. Somebody else needs to hear it. So when they refuse, you keep going. Keep trying with somebody else. Acts chapter 19, verse 8, Paul, or it says of Paul, it says, And he went into the synagogue and spoke, spoke boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading. He's trying to convince them concerning the things of the kingdom of God. Verse 9 says, But when some were hardened and did not believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, what did Paul do? He departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily at the school of Tyrannus. Verse 10 says, And this continued for two, two years, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. You know, if Paul would have stayed where he was and said, No, I'm going to keep preaching until they listen, all these people wouldn't have got to hear. But, you know, what did Paul do when these individuals started blaspheming? And they became hardened, and he knew at that point he had presented it, they weren't going to accept it. He did not continue casting his pearls before the swine. He did not just continue trying to force feed it to them. They weren't accepting it, but he picked up his things and moved somewhere else. And went to preach to somebody else to give them a chance. Acts 28, verse 24, says about Paul's preaching, it says, And some were persuaded by the things which were spoken, and some were not. Some disbelieved. Verse 30 of that chapter says, Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. So let me just ask you, you know, think about Paul's preaching, how he preached the gospel. Where do you think Paul got this idea from? You know, I'm just going to keep on preaching. To different people preaching and see who listens. Where do you think Paul got that method? I'd say he got it right from the Great Commission. Jesus Christ himself. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Mark 16, 15, and 16. That's the gospel in essence. When you lead a horse to water, don't be discouraged when it refuses to drink. Because it's not on you, it's on them. And do just like Paul did. Just keep preaching. Just keep showing people and giving new invitations. Don't let anybody shut you up. Preach the good news. I'll close this lesson by asking you one more interesting question. And we'll wrap up here. I just ask you tonight, is there any chance that you are a stubborn old horse? who will not be made to drink. Is that any of you here tonight? So now the question comes to each individual. Are you someone who has been led to the living waters of eternal life and you know the truth?
you've read the Bible, you know what it says, you know what you have to do to be saved. And it's right before you, but you refuse it. Maybe you are already a Christian, and you're sitting in these pews every week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, but you don't live it in your daily life. Maybe there's sin in your life as a Christian that you've not been taken care of. The Bible says we need to walk in the light as he is in the light. And the blood of Christ will continue to bless us and cleanse us from all sins. But let me tell you, I can preach about righteousness up here and holiness and tell you the way it is until I'm black and blue in the face. But the truth of this lesson is still the same. It's still up to each individual on whether or not they will follow it in their own life. So I can't make you do it. God won't make you do it. Jesus won't make you do it. They could. But it must be your choice. We're about to sing a song in just a moment. Verse 2 goes like this. It says, There is a well in a desert plain. Its waters call with entreating strain. Oh, every thirsting, sin-sick soul, come freely drink, and thou shalt be whole. Then why will you die? Oh, why will you die when the living well is so nearby? Oh, why will you die? Don't be the horse that will not be made to drink. The invitation is yours if you're not a Christian tonight. This is the message that we're going to preach to the whole world. You've got to hear the word. You've got to hear what you must do to be saved in Jesus Christ. The message of the gospel. Because if you can't hear it, you can't do it. Number two, you've got to believe it. You've got to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's the only one sent from heaven for the remission of sins. He died on the cross so that you can obtain the forgiveness of sins. You have to repent, number three. That means I'm going to go, before I make a commitment, I'm going to change my, my mind that I'm going to have a change of my life. And then I'm going to make the commitment. And then number four, you have to confess him before men. And then he will confess you before his Father and his holy angels. And lastly, the Bible says... He who believes and is what? Baptized shall be saved. And the Bible describes baptism as an immersion in water to wash away your sins. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. And you come up out of that water, that's where God has cleansed us. And we come up out of the water through faith in the operation of God. And we remain faithful until death. And he will give us the crown. So remember, you can lead a horse to water. But you cannot make him drink. Won't you make the choice to drink tonight as we stand and as we sing? There is a rock in a wheel.